Okay, we're running a little late, so I'm going to quickly introduce our speaker, um, as you many um, protégés here of Joe. So Joe has a MA in clinical psychology, and he was in private practice for 32 years. He also served as the clinical director of Family Service Agency in Santa Rosa and taught at JFK University in Concord for six years. I'm sorry, for eight years in their uh, Masters of Psychology program. He also founded the Domestic Violence Treatment Program at Family Service Agency and taught at Sonoma State in CEUs and classes on domestic violence treatment for six years. So thank you for being with us, Joe. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, all. First of all, I want to start out by saying what a pleasure it is to be in the midst of a group of people that for their living and for their passions go inward. Um, there's a safety in being around a group of people who self-examine and assist other people to self-examine. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. There's lots of good juju in this room. Uh, there's some handouts in front of you. I'm going to quickly go over them. Uh, the first page is some key points. You can look at that on your own. The next part is the, the summary. Um, the next two pages are the summary of what I'm going to be talking about. And the final page on this group is references. And then the next group of sheets is called emotional reclamation. And I'm going to be going over that uh, in detail um, as uh, a way to work with men in these, this area I'm going to be talking about. Fundamentally, the problem with, okay, fundamentally, the, the problem that most of us men have, and I include myself in this group, to one extent or another, is a difficulty going inward. And by going inward, that's a very broad topic, but I think most of you know what I mean by going inward. You know, going inside and utilizing the resources and the strengths and the issues that we have internally and using that in our lives to make sense out of our lives and meaning. What I'm going to say is my truth. I don't think that it has to be your truth. I don't think it has to be anybody's truth. One of the big problems in this world right now are people and organizations trying to tell people what their truth should be. Um, and um, the reason I ended up in Vietnam was because I believed what other people told me. And I didn't know how to go inward yet. So take what you want from what I'm going to say. Disregard the rest. I did private practice for over 30 years, and I loved it. I loved working with clients. And about five years into it, I realized that my theoretical orientation, which was a, what do they call it, an eclectic orientation, I realized that it basically was about my life. The things that I believed, the, the, the ideas that I utilized in therapy, the techniques, the things that I did, really sprung from my life. And that sort of made sense to me. And I think if you look at your theoretical orientation, you might see the same thing. That, you, that it's literally an expression of the experiences that you've had, of the things that you've worked on, that you've grown in, of the things that you've worked on and you're still struggling with. That literally, it's a mirror of your life. And once I realized that, I got real comfortable with it because I realized that my theoretical orientation was me. It's a, I realized it's a living, growing construct that's continually changing. Um, I've supervised between 150 and 200 interns uh, in my career. And um, I realized that, that when I would start working with an intern, that they were already healers. You know, I'll bet you everyone, every person in this room, you're the kind of person that people tell you their problems. People come to you, friends come to you, people you just meet, they come to you, they ask you for advice. 
all of a sudden you're sitting around and they're telling your problems for 10 minutes, you want to leave the room, but of course you'll listen for a while. And there's just something, about, I think that therapists are born. The people that I, I worked with who didn't have that quality about them had a very difficult time in the field. In fact, in my work with interns, I would tell them that you're 80% there already. You already got the right stuff. In fact, often the big thing that I, when I worked with interns was around confidence, it was about the, the intern reclaiming their own power, their own sense, their own healing abilities. Sure, there's about 20% that we had to teach people that you got to learn. You got to learn about how to deal with uh, uh, suicide. You got to learn how to uh, you know, deal with insurance and law and ethics and you know, that kind of stuff. But the basic, the basic juju is already there. In fact, when I would interview interns for, the, for jobs at, uh, at the, at, at the uh, Family Service Agency, one of the main qualities I looked for, I didn't know they'd be nervous, so that was there, but was did I feel like there was this avenue that they were a part of that there was a connection between me and them. And if I felt that, they were in. Because that was, I believe, the healing agency right there. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. I don't think this is, a, this is not rocket science. I think that's one of the things that people, when they come into the field, they get overwhelmed with all these ideas and they're told that this is the right way, that's the right way. This is not rocket science, it's pretty simple. It's sitting down with another person, often it's sitting down with them can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and allowing the connection to happen and allowing the, the communion of that to really heal both the client and the therapist. An examined life is a powerful thing. And that's one of the, that's one of the safe qualities of being in this room because I know, I know I'm among people who examine their lives. And that's literally what we're assisting clients to do, is to examine their lives usually. So the ideas I'm presenting are really about my life, of course with some input from outside, Carl Jung, Carl Rogers, Stanley Milgram, Bob Dylan, <laughs> all the people that I've worked with. But particularly, one of the big areas is the women that have been in my life, as professionally and personally. Um, I want to thank women for modeling for me, encouraging me, demanding it of me that I go inward, that I go inside and connect with my emotions and connect with the power and the beauty and the sacredness of what's inside. So thank you women. And I think that it's, it's really important that women be honored for this. Last night I was at a poker game, I played a lot of poker. And I told the guys that I was doing this talk today. And one guy said to me, men will never change. What are you going to tell them? That they're going to change? Men are never going to change. Another guy said, I think men should take a back seat and let women run the world. <laughs> and one of the guys laughed at that. He just thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. So one thing I, I realized that the more I trusted myself, the more I trusted who I was in the sessions with clients, uh, the better off the clients did and the better off I did. Playfully, I look at my therapist, I look at my orientation, and it's, it, I, can, I can describe it from three lines from two songs. Okay? When it comes to diagnosis, and this isn't with every client, but in general, with most clients, it's a line from Paul Simon, the boxer. Okay. A man sees what he wants to see and disregards the rest. No, I'm sure he meant a woman too. And to me, that was the diagnostic issue for so many clients, and myself too, by the way, my issues, which is that we get stuck in patterns, whether they're emotional, brain-wise, behavior, thought, and we don't see the other possibilities. So when people would come to me, that was one of my jobs, was to assist them to broaden it out, to see other possibilities. Then we moved to a line from Bob Dylan's, uh, a line from the Bob Dylan song, Subterranean Homesick Blues, which is, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. <laughs> right? That the client, literally, to assist the client to realize that the truth is going here. Go inside. Utilize this stuff. All these experts out here in the world, including the therapist, they can give you some ideas, 
but it's really going to move to inside. And then the final line, which is my favorite line from rock music, and I love rock music in my whole life. It's from the same subterranean homesick blues. Don't follow leaders and watch the parking meters. So that, that, when you start going inward, trust yourself. Sure, listen to what other people got to say, but you're the one. In fact, I ended up in Vietnam because I believed what other people said. I believed when the president said that we were supposed to be there. I believed this stuff, and that was one of the great lessons for me in not following leaders and watching the parking meters. So um, I'm not talking about every man today. I'm talking about most of us to one extent or the other. There are a lot of men who are really disconnected from their emotional center and really connected to their, to their outer focus, which I'm going to talk about what that means in a while. But most of us guys, we are, you know, somewhere in between. I believe, and I learned this when my sons were born, I believe boys are born with their emotions fully intact. If you've had a son, you've seen that. You've seen that from the very beginning, their emotions poured out of them. What happens? as time goes by. I think that for me, when I was born, I'll give it 100%. I was 100% emotionally connected. By the time I ended up in Vietnam, I think I was 40% connected to the emotions. I think I've reclaimed about 30, 35% of them. I know these numbers are ridiculous, but they feel right to me. I'm at about 70 to 75% of what I was as a boy. And I think that's as far as I'm going. <laughs> That's about it, you know, because of the different things that have happened in my life that have caused me to pull back from these emotions and not use them, etc. What I'm going to say today, I often, with male clients and female clients, use it as an educational tool. I put, I threw these ideas out to the client. And a lot of men can, re can really can benefit from hearing these ideas if you want to use them. Does that make sense to people? Like an educational component of work with men and women. And when I, my wife Fran over there, she's a retired uh, social worker. Um, when we first met, I started talking to her about these ideas. Fran, what was your reaction? She said, oh, is that the reason they're so awful? <laughs> now, I know she was exaggerating a bit, but um, I think that by really trying to understand the real reasons why men are the way they are, or some men are the way they are, um, it, it can be very helpful. It's not just like, you know, like what the one guy at the poker game said, men are never going to change. In other words, it's almost like men are a, uh, men are a dead end part of the species. You know, they're just going to be stuck in where they are. And I don't believe that's true. And I think that, that as men start to learn to go inward, particularly boys are modeled and taught to go inward, there's going to be a dramatic change in this world. A dramatic change. Mm -hmm. So feel free, any comments, questions, etc. And I, if you do have questions, use the mic, okay? I'll run it to you. Is there okay. a question somewhere? Over here. Thank you so much. This is so great. Um, I'm just curious about circumcision and um, you know your thoughts about that and um, my sense is that just is so impactful for men and what you're talking about and just wondering yeah. your comments on that. Well you know in general men are tough guys right and uh, not really but you know and, and there, there, there's supposed to be this toughness and there is this sort of it's interesting that there is this sort of outcry now about clitoral um, mutilation, right? And there isn't this corresponding outcry about um, circumcision. Now, it's, it's a complicated one because there's lots of sp religious connotations with it, etc. But um, uh, I believe that um, it's something that uh, is going to be really spoken about more and looking at it in terms of, you know, that, that, inf that infant boys going through this excruciatingly, I mean, it almost makes me want to cringe down here as I talk about it, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, I have, I have yes. just a question about something you said much earlier on and your thoughts about it. So you were talking about when you were recruiting interns and you said the feeling of just, I'm connecting with them, I'm connecting with them, which I get and understand having done much of that in my own career. But I've been thinking more about, okay, so we've, you know, you do that with people we feel connected with. What about people who have, what about our 
responsibility as supervisors, leaders, to, to recruit people with more diverse experiences. Of course. We can't personally necessarily connect with because their experience, because of their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, whatever, is so different. But yeah, that's, I just want to make that oh, comment yeah, that, that yeah. I would hope that people would yeah. not just you know, would be, realize that we really do want to have more diversity in our profession. Sometimes we might need to stretch ourselves and take that intern yes. who might not quite come from a different world yes. th than we do and just accept that and understand the privilege we could have in helping somebody be able to serve a community that perhaps is underserved. Yes. Okay. Um, so I was in Vietnam and uh, I uh, got to my unit and I had been trained to be a um, Morse code operator and they didn't do Morse code in Vietnam. I went to an armored infantry unit, uh, tanks and armored personnel carriers. And when I got there, they told me I was going to be the company messenger, and they gave me a brand new Jeep. And they told me that the previous company messenger, two weeks before, had gone over a mine in the road and was killed. And I wasn't afraid. I was not afraid. It wasn't courage. Courage being you're afraid you do. No, I didn't have fear. In fact, I had lost my fear years before. A big part of it was high school basketball and learning that you had to really push your fear away. Push your, and also growing up a boy, I, I, when I grew up, if you showed fear, you were mocked, you were ridiculed, you were put down. So I had learned how to distance from my fear already. You put me in a, a, a job right now in which I'm driving a Jeep and the person had been killed two weeks before running a mine, over a mine, I'd be afraid. So one day I, I come back from, the, from, the, from my job and it had been a really bad day for our unit and they were serving us hot chow, and there was this creek running through our area, and I walked through the creek area to get to the hot food. Hot food was a, I was out in the field the whole time, so hot food was a real, real treat. We ate sea rations most of the time. And there's this creek, and I walk in there, and I've got a 45 caliber pistol strapped, and I've got a, you know, M16 over my shoulder. And I heard this gargling sound, and they're drowning a prisoner. It's a Green Beret and, a, and another soldier were drowning this prisoner. I was sort of shocked. Although torturing prisoners was commonplace. I was sort of shocked. And then I looked at the bank of the creek and there was another prisoner tied up. His hands were tied, his legs were tied. And our eyes met. And he was frightened. And I knew he was frightened. And then I looked down and I saw his equipment. I mean, he had a pith helmet. Some, some rubber sandals, an AK-47, some shells, a little bit of rice and corn. He had nothing. I thought about all that we had. And I immediately felt really quickly shame. And I knew in that moment that I was involved in an evil enterprise. That I was on the side of evil. Yes. Wait, hang on. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. She said thank you for saying that. Okay. So, uh, and then I looked at him again, and his look turned from fear to disgust. And I knew that I was an invader in his country. And then I walked on for child. I didn't tell any of my friends about it, because they had their own stories from that day and the week and the month, but we didn't talk about that stuff. And it wasn't like I forgot about that story. I remembered the story, but I had literally no emo The only emotional connection I had to it was, was around the fact that I knew that I'd been duped into being part of an evil enterprise. About 10 years later, I was involved in, um, in Berkeley in cooperative camps for children, which was a summer camp for children. And it was modeled after the commie camps. I don't know if you ever heard about the commie camps on the East Coast, commie camps on quotes, that back in the 50s and 60s, there were these summer camps. A lot of it was for, for Jewish folks in which they did left-wing politics as part of the summer camps. So we, we, we did that in Berkeley. And I was giving a talk about this, and I was mostly talking about the fact that, you know, I was involved in an evil enterprise. And I started to talk about it, and I burst out crying. And that was literally the first time I had cried in 19 years. And I ran out of the building, and some of my friends came out, my daughter, and they comforted me. And, and then that started, and I was in therapy, and that started the next few weeks, 
all these emotions started to bubble out around that. Sadness, guilt, shame, admiration for this man. I was, I would, at the time I thought, I, I would hope I would do what he does in defending his country. And what happened? Where, where were these emotions all those years? Next incident, uh, it was during the monsoon and uh, it was, the roads were all impassable so they, they put me on a helicopter. I don't know if you Huey helicopters, Vietnam War, you've all seen the, the big wide open spaces on the side. You know, a, uh, you know, a door gunner over here and I'm sitting alone in there. And I guess there had been a firefight and the medevac helicopter wasn't available so we landed and they threw this guy in and he was messed up. And I was sitting and his pants leg is blown off and he's got these, this freckled leg and he's got a he's redheaded crew cut guy, freckles, and he doesn't look good. And the helicopter pulls up real fast and banks because, uh, you know, they bank because they're afraid of getting hit by a rocket propelled grenade if they go up straight. And he started to roll out. So I kind of jumped down and grabbed him. I was really stiff-armed and held him. And uh, it took about 10 minutes and he turned blue. He died. And um, when I got off the, they took him out of the helicopter, went back to my unit, didn't talk about it. You know, nobody wanted to hear that stuff. About 14 years later, I'm in bed with my wife, and she's asking me some, some stuff about Vietnam, and I started telling her about this incident, and I started to sob. I had sobbed since I was maybe five years old, and I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Next night, same thing, sobbed for two more hours. And all these feelings came up around it. You know, why didn't I give him artificial respiration? Why couldn't I have held him? I was like this, you know? Why couldn't I have just held him? And where was all these emotions all that time? Where, where were they? They just popped out. Uh, my wife uh, has really assisted me because um, as I worked on these and I realized that, you know, I had to feel these emotions. I had to feel the shame. I had to feel the guilt. I had to feel the fear. I had to feel the sadness. But I still had one that hung on to me. And that's that there was no excuse that I was a spoke in the wheel of evil. There was no excuse in my mind. And my wife really assisted me in really looking at that and just forgiving myself. And I was a 19-year-old young man. Okay. Why? Why was there so much... Why was there so much racism over there amongst the GIs? Why were so many soldiers willing to do what they were told even though it was really bad? It wasn't just like, go shoot somebody. It was like doing bad things, burning down villages, et cetera, et cetera. How could the chaplain, when I went to t talk to the chaplain, tell me that we were doing God's will in Vietnam? So, studies have been done. Most boys after the age of nine never cry in public. So my sons were born, and it just poured out of them. Their emotions just were there 100%. You ever had a child, son, you saw it. Anger, sadness, fear, awe, love, joy, and they just pour out of them, right? And that taught me something, and that's that boys are born with their emotional access fully intact. Now, prior to civilization with men, it was the same deal. It's only been 10,000 years. This, t this did not just develop in this 10,000 year period. This was also with man prior to civilization. The, I believe that the, the, the emotions are from the body. If you've ever seen the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? They have a great explanation of what the brain does in terms of peptides going through the bloodstream and they contain the emotional seeds and the, and the, and the, uh, the cells pick them up and that's why we feel emotions that literally they arise in the body and they, emotions were invented 
by the mammals prior to us. If you ever have had a dog, you know that that creature has emotions. Right? And, and, and any, any, any animals that live in packs, emotions tend to be part of the communication stuff that goes on. So literally, they arise in the body and they get expressed. They're designed to get expressed. And another important part is they're designed to get a reaction. It's one of the great traumas for children that are sexually abused, let's say, or, or abused in one way or another, and they speak out about it, or one way or another they express those emotions and they're not reacted to favorably. And they quickly learn not to express those emotions. Does that make sense to everybody? So the environmental response to the emotions is powerful. Another aspect of the emotions that I learned when I was in hospice, when my, my wife previously died, and I went to the hospice, was that literally I learned that you just had to express everything that came up. You just express it, express it, express it, and somehow or other, the slate gets wiped kind of clean. So there's another aspect of emotions that it's designed to kind of clear us up, too. I think the only two emotions that aren't built in are guilt and shame. I think we learned those. So the emotions are, were, were in early man and women to the full extent they are now at birth. So what happened? Why do so many men have such a hard time going inward like that? Well, the obvious answer is culture. Culture does a lot to that. Um, so, in, in your notes, EA means emotional access. That means going inward and having that connection and expression. The outward focus now is also, I think, an inherited DNA designed behavior set in men. And I think most men are born with a certain amount of outer focus, some more than others. I think I was born, a lot, you know, when you hear about alpha male, okay? Alpha male tends to be a lot of outward focus. Now, outward focus has these main qualities. One, aggression. That can lead to violence. Two, sort of a, a drive towards competition, competing. Three, a sense of looking at your relationship with other men in terms of a hierarchy. Where do you stand with other men? Four, uh, just a general keeping the focus out there. Ever read Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, or whatever that one was, you know, and they put two women in a room with a window and two chairs, and they have them talk about something, and they turn the chairs toward each other, and they go on. And when the men tend to sit side by side and look out the window, keep their focus out there and talk, and the last one is a tendency to dampen emotions, to dampen the emotions down. I believe that that was also present in early man. But I think that prior to civilization, uh, another interesting thing was that, you know, that, that you know, folks who study this, I've read quite a bit about it, that, you know, that, that women did, you know, <laughs> you know had children, you know, that whole thing, took care of children. But also women were really involved in the gathering of, you know, vegetables and other things to eat like that. And the, the, the speculation is pretty widely accepted now is that women invented farming. The men didn't invent farming. Women invented farming. That literally they learned how to take the, the roots or whatever, or the seeds, and to literally, you know, make a patch and grow it. But men, men were really involved in, one, protecting the clan, two, having to deal with rivals, both within the clan and other clans, hunting for food, and we were not top of the food chain then. Protection against predators that would eat people. So I think that early man distanced themselves from the emotional center they had and really gravitated to the outward focus for the survival of the species. And I'm not saying at all that that was the main reason the species survived. The, the qualities that women had and what they did were just as important as what men did.
Any questions about that? Comments? So what about hunting and protecting would make men have to suppress emotion? I, I saw, one time in Vietnam, um, I saw a guy, the medics were talking to him, and he pushed the medics away, and he started to scream. And he was like this big guy, and it was like a big draft horse. He was really angry and stomping. And the medics couldn't contain him, and three other guys came and finally got him down. And I said to my buddy who's standing next to me, I think he knows where he is. That literally when it comes to um, fighting other clans, you know, killing animals, um, uh, those kind of activities, emotions tend to get in the way. Um, and that staying outward focused, you, you're better at that skill than when your emotions get in the way. Now I think that, that in, the, in the large scale, it'd be great if hunters had emotional access, right? That that was all part of it. But I think that, that the bottom line is that, that, that I know in Vietnam, like, like I told you about, I just stayed away from those feelings. I mean, those feelings were dangerous, I think. Dangerous to have, yeah. It might be involved in the brain physiology too, because if you're in a fight or flight mode and your body's pumped with adrenaline, your emotion, it's about survival at that point. Yeah. Um, so your motion shut down. Yeah. Because you're always on the lookout and you have to be aware of it. So there's a biological component right. to it. Right. Yeah, good, good, good point. I have another question, but I just want to say thank you for talking about Vietnam and I. You know, I think people's hearts are just really open t to you, and I hope some of it just allows you to have less of it if we hit Oh, it. sure. I'm, um, I'm, I'm open to it all. I yeah. gotta be. But I wanted to talk those about not, your... as, as Bob Dylan said, those not busy being born are busy dying, so that's the way it goes. I have a question about your poker game. And yeah. um, I'm guessing I would not be allowed to come to your poker game. Oh, no, there's a, a, a bunch of the games women play. Pardon me? And, and a bunch of the games women play in these games. Okay. Well, yeah. I, what I wanted you to share, and I really love and respect men, what is it for men that they don't, and believe me, women like it when it's just women yeah. often. Well, can you talk about what it is for men when there aren't women in the room yeah. that feels better for them? When I was in Vietnam, I have never been close, and I've been with a lot of groups of men in my life, believe me, I've met men's groups, been participants in weekends, I have very close men friends, a lot of them. I have my poker friends, I, have, I still play basketball, I'm 71, I have my basketball friends. The closest I've ever been to a group of men was my good friends in Vietnam. We loved each other, unconditionally. And so many men, so many men that I work with, so many men I know are isolated. I'm not talking about men who just have these huge problems I'm talking about. I'm talking about men who are, are kind of connected to their emotions, but they tend to be isolated and not have other men to hang with. And I think it's such a powerful thing for men, especially for men, to be around other men who can go inward. And the, the depth and the safety and the, the coming home that's involved in that. Uh, but even if it's not, even if it's just like the poker guys I hang around with and all we do is BS all night and, you know, have fun, you know, teasing each other and stuff, there's still a real, you know, like, like a lot of times a fuck you is basically I love you, you know? And, I, and you know it is because it's not done with the you know, fuck you, you know, it's, you know. So I think it's really important for men. And one thing that uh, we have some uh, so folks who have worked in the domestic violence program and domestic violence treatment program at Family Service Agency, um, what I saw was that when men come into a situation in which there are some men who are going inward and wanting that and are hungry for that, they often see that and it's modeled for them and they move toward it, realizing they had a hunger for this, but they just didn't know it. 
that answer? I love the term, fuck you very much, at a poker game. <laughs> okay, right. Excuse my language, everybody. I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Uh, you, just, to, to have... just to note, uh, you know, of appreciation of what you're saying and just to underline uh, what's striking me, which is you're uh, saying that in the distant past, men had to bury emotions in order to protect. And yet it seems we're in a day and age where, uh, you know, men's ability to feel and to be inward is a absolutely a process of survival in our yes, current day. Survival for the world. The one of the one second one of the one of the outcomes of a man who connects with their insides is the ability to have compassion, empathy, ability to cooperate, and sensitivity. Um, I believe that powerful and non-powerful men that are really disconnected from their emotional center, their emotional access, and who really act out. The, do you all understand when I say by the, by the outer focus, they're really acting that out. They, they, a lot of our leaders, a lot of corporation leaders, a lot of men who really don't have much power in the sense of folks, men who get into domestic violence or severe drug and alcohol stuff, that they don't have an access to compassion, empathy, really the ability to cooperate and sensitivity. And we look at these men and we go, why don't they choose that? I can choose that. Why don't they choose that? It's because they can't. It's not in their repertoire. They don't have that. They can get it, but they don't have it, and they don't think they need it. And there's one thing about men that are really extreme on the outer focus is that they act like often they're doing great. I'm the king of the world, so to speak. They're not. Men who are disconnected from their emotional center are miserable. They have to put a show on that they're not. Does that make sense to people? And there's all sorts of co-diagnostic stuff that goes on with these men. Depression, drug and alcohol abuse. You could probably name 50 different diagnostic possibilities and categories. Yeah, we got some more questions? You know, I work with mostly with trauma and um, mostly with women, but I've had many male clients over the years, and I'm, as you're talking, one of my particular clients is coming to mind, and we would be doing EMDR, and, and it's, it was like he would say, it was like he had the Great Wall of China you know, separating the two yeah. hemispheres of yes. his brain that yes. he could not connect, and he was a, a sexual assault survivor from childhood, and he just couldn't get into the feelings yeah. of that at all. Yes. Um, and it sort of fits with what you're saying about that there can't be that inward connection That's because right. of that yes. lack of connection. Yes. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a great trauma. It's a huge trauma for men, for some men. And I'm not, when I say that, I'm not justifying what a man might do with that stuff. I'm not saying that it's okay to do maybe what someone does with it. But we, we have to really keep in mind that there is a huge trauma underneath that. There's a huge, what's the word I want? There's a huge, give me some words. Uh, vacuum. vacuum, wound, uh, uh, yeah, hole. Okay, next, somebody else want to? Uh, I just thought it might be interesting to throw it into this mix, uh, working with a lot of transgender people. Uh, uh, I hear over and over from trans men who, you know, whose bodies were formerly awash with feminine hormones, female hormones, and now they've got testosterone as the dominant hormone. They Interesting. They feel less. They what? They feel less. They, they don't connect as easily to their emotions, and yeah. they cry less. Yes. I hear this all the time. So there's obviously some physiological yes. thing that's developed over time, yes. I guess, probably. Yes. Just to... I thought that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this may not be really relevant to what you're talking about today, but the point that you're bringing Vietnam up is, um, was a disaster because uh, I have one brother-in-law that died as a result of Agent Orange, now 15 years later, after he comes back from Vietnam. 
he dies. My sister-in-law is getting benefits because it was directly related to Agent Orange. My other brother-in-law is dying of that now. Again, he's getting benefits. But it's been proven how many. You know, so the disaster goes on. Oh, yeah. And uh, a good friend of mine, husband, died of Agent Orange related. Um, so that, that's three people. Huh. My husband, I, you know, was in Vietnam at the same time they all were. He's okay right now. But that, you know, that's something you think about. Oh, yeah. So um, when you're talking about, you know, feeling guilt or feeling all this stuff, that, that happens. Yeah. Is it not? You guys, I'm going to take one more question, then I'm going to okay. move on so for a while, a then we'll come back, because i got to make sure I... I Recently, I heard someone speak about how, I believe it was the brain part, maybe the cingulate insular, or insular cingulate, is actually smaller in men, and that's the part of the brain that allows them to go inside. Mm -hmm. That's part of my question. And the second one, you may get to, but uh, comes from my experience of working with a man who said, you know, people talk about, what are you feeling, and I don't know. So we did this little exercise where I approached him and I said, this pillow is your mother and I'm walking toward you. And both him and I recognized he flinched. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the way of working with this to go to the sensations and reactivity and yes. being awareness. Yes. Okay, you guys, I got I to gotta move on. We'll get back to other questions.